All right. Hey, good morning. Oh, you got to swing the mic over, my dumbass. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's been a minute since I've been down here uh, recording videos. This damn COVID then took me out, and I'm still working my way back through it. It's just long, lingering effects, I guess. Uh, some of y'all have reached out to me and told me that y'all have been battling with it for several months. I am definitely sorry to hear that. Um, all right, so today um, you all sent me over a bunch of questions um, and what I did was I organized them all together to kind of make this as easy as possible for people. Um, and then from there, I went ahead and put together a slide deck to kind of go over like everything. So that way you have a visual representation that matches my voice as well, what we're talking about. So I'm gonna go through there. As always, feel free to drop questions in the chat. I'll try to knock those out as they come along. And then at the end, if we still have questions, we can cut on the microphones and go from there. Uh, but hopefully, we should be done in about 30, 40 minutes. You're welcome to leave whenever you want. All right, let's get rocking and rolling. All right, so I'm Stanley Tate, as y'all know, student loan lawyer. I help people solve student loan problems. This is what I do. Um, the questions, let's get the slide deck going. All right, so the big thing is the government went ahead and extended the freeze for federal student loans through May 1st, 2022. Payments were supposed to start back in February, but they stretched them out due to uh, the coronavirus variant, uh, what is it, uh, Omicron, Omarion, whatever, that thing, they stretched it out till May 2nd. But I want to make sure that we're all clear on how this works because a lot of you ask kind of questions that are covered by the freeze, but you're not really sure how it applies to you. So let's do that. All right, so the benefits. And you'll see here, like I have an image like of my website. I, I address all the stuff for you guys on the blog as well, so everything's there for you um, to back up what it is we're talking about here. All right, benefits. All right, the interest rate has been set to 0%, no payments are due, credit towards both PSLF, so public service loan forgiveness, and IDR forgiveness, and then you're not eligible to like for wage garnishment, tax refund offset, or social security benefit offset, during the freeze. So some of you are thinking about filing your taxes now and you're like, well, I'm in default and am I gonna get my refund back? And my answer to you is that it depends, right? Because like assuming you file a return and then it is processed accordingly, like you file in February, you should get your refund back before May 1st hits. But there's no guarantee that could be held up for whatever reason. So if you filed before May, and then your return refund doesn't get scheduled to deposit until after May 1st, then you could be at risk of getting your refund garnished, so offset. So if it were me, what I would do is get out of default first. That would be everything that I would do there. All right, uh, <clears throat> now who's eligible for the freeze? Now this was always confusing to people because they thought they had federal loans, but the problem is it only applied to direct loans, including Parent PLUS loans. Now, federal student loans in default, it also applied to those, direct loans and fail loans, but initially it didn't apply to these other type of FFEO loans. So some of you were still being garnished, but then the government changed the rules along the way and said, no, we're gonna give the, we're gonna protect everyone in default from garnishment. And then some fail loans that are owned by the Department of Education were also covered. And again, this is where it gets confusing because many of you don't really understand your loans. You're just like, well, I make payments to Navian, I make payments to Nelnet, but you, you have to understand the type of loans to understand what your rights are. And really this just goes down to how like the federal student loan lending system all began where it initially started with private banks were making the loans and those private banks are these older FFEL loans. Now the government bought some of those loans um, because they were trying to get rid of banks out of the system because they're like uh, under President Obama, they were like, hey, we're losing a lot of money with this program because it was subsidized and all these other payments were going on. But they didn't buy all of those FFEL loans. So some of you have loans that are owned by private companies that are backed by the federal government and you didn't receive any of these uh, benefits from the freeze. Now who's not eligible? Fell loans in good standing that are owned by a guarantee agency. Now sometimes you call your servicer and you'll be like, what type of loans I have? And they'll be like, oh, you have commercial loans. And you think that means private. And many times it doesn't. What it actually means is that you have this type of federal student loan that's backed by a commercial entity called a guarantee agency, and then it's insured by the federal government. So if you were to default, then the government can exercise its rights to buy that loan and bring it into their control. Perkins loans, and then private student loans. Now Perkins loans, let me back up. Uh, Perkins loans, they are loans made directly by your school to you under a federal loan program. 
And not many of you actually have these, they're such a small amount, but they do exist. And Perkins Loans, they didn't qualify uh, for, for the freeze as well. All right, let me go back. All right, so how to become eligible. You can still become eligible um, if you uh, make your fail and Perkins loans by consolidating them into a direct consolidation loan. For some of you, that makes sense. For others of you, you have such a low interest rate and like you also have like this like little subsidy thing that reduces your interest rate down further um, that you could potentially lose if you consolidate. Now, normally when you consolidate, you, your interest rate stays what it is, but there's a very small minority of you that have this bonus into your contract that says, oh, you get like a half percent off because you kept your loans with us. Um, other ways, you can't add private student loans to a consolidation application with the federal government. That's a big thing. Some of you ask me, oh, can I convert my loans back? Because some of you had federal loans refinanced with a private lender because you're like, oh, I could pay this off. And then now you're like, well, can I reconvert them back from private to federal? And the answer is you can't do that. All right, there's no way to change a private loan into a federal loan. All right, now many of you have been asking, do I qualify for loan forgiveness? And the reality is there are a few forgiveness programs, but many of you are only gonna qualify for one or two for the most part. And that's either gonna be public service loan forgiveness or the newly announced PSLF waiver. And this is for you if you work for the government or nonprofit. The rest of you are going to qualify for IDR forgiveness. This is income driven repayment plan forgiveness. There's also total and permanent disability. So if you have like a mental or physical disability, you can get rid of your federal student loans if the disability is severe enough. And then there's borrowed defense to repayment. This is for people that went to like fraudulent schools that lied to them about job placement, all these things. Now, many of you went to these schools and you're you clearly were impacted. There's lawsuits against them and everything like that, but the process to get rid of them through the federal government, it's really difficult, and it was especially difficult under the Trump administration um, to get rid of the loans. So there, I, I generally don't help people with this because I don't know like if it really benefits you to hire me for that. Um, but what I am gonna do is just dive into these real quick just so you all have an understanding of how they work. Um, also, there's death discharge. So federal student loans go away at your death. All right, most people will qualify. Yeah, I got that, boom, look at me, look at me. Also, disability discharge. If your doctor, the SSA, or VA determine you can no longer work due to a severe permanent disability, then at that point you can apply for the discharge. So you don't need to wait on Social Security, don't need to wait on VA if your doctor says that you're totally and permanently disabled. All right, let's talk about PSLF. All right, you're eligible if you work full-time for the government or a qualifying nonprofit. Your nonprofit qualifies automatically if it's a 501c3. Some of you don't work at a 501c3. You work at another type of 501 entity. Other nonprofits can qualify if they perform a public service. So it don't matter if you're at a 501c6, a 501c24, or whatever. These are just different types of nonprofits under the IRS code. It doesn't matter what type of nonprofit you are. It matters, does your nonprofit provide a public service? Now, there's a list of public service um, qualifying things, but basically it's like, do you participate in education? Are you working for health services, library, policing, something like that? If your nonprofit doesn't do that type of work, then you're not gonna qualify. PSLF, um, and this is where it gets confusing too, because many of you initially were on track for PSLF, but then you were told you didn't qualify because you had the wrong type of loan or you made the wrong type of payment. And so there's the original PSLF program. Congress tried to fix it by creating what's called temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness, but that program didn't help many people because it only fixed the wrong payment plan problem. So if you had made payments under the extended or graduated plan, it helped you qualify for PSLF, but it did nothing for you if you had those older FFEL loans. And that's where things have changed recently in the last couple of months under the Biden administration where they created the PSLF waiver. Now this waiver fixes the wrong loan and the wrong payment plan. But this thing is temporary. It only lasts through October 31st, 2022. Now, you could apply any time from now through then. And applying is really easy. Like, all you have to do is, um, there's certain things you have to do, I'll, I'll get to it later, but it's really straightforward. Now, who's eligible? You're eligible if you have direct loans. 
then you'll need to certify your employment. If all your loans are direct loans, certify your employment. If you have FFEL or Perkins loans, you'll need to consolidate those loans first and then certify your employment. And then who's not eligible? Now this is a big thing. Borrowers seeking to get rid of Parent PLUS loans, including loans that consolidated Parent PLUS loans, aren't eligible for the waiver. They're still eligible for PSLF, but they can't get credit for those payments they made on the wrong type of Parent PLUS loan. So if they had an FFEL loan, or maybe they combine their loans with their parent loans with their loans, then you're not able to get credit for that. We have people trying to do that, but it hasn't been successful thus far. Borrowers trying to eliminate private student loans. Private student loans aren't eligible. So for instance, some of you had federal loans and you worked for the government and you decided to refinance and then you turned them into a private loan. Now you see this waiver and you're like, can I take advantage of it? And the answer is no. There's no way for you to turn and get credit for that private loan now that you've refinanced it. There's no way to undo that. All right, let's talk about income driven repayment forgiveness. This is the one that pretty much every federal student loan borrower that has a high balance is gonna to try to take, uh, take advantage of. All right, now income driven repayment plans, IBR, ICR, PAYE, and repay, they give you an affordable payment based on your income and family size, but they also come with an added bonus. They give you loan forgiveness after 20 to 25 years worth of payments. Now, it whether you get your loans forgiven in 20 years or 25 years depends on whether or not you borrowed federal loans for graduate school or if you're eligible for the PAYE plan, the pay plan. Only people eligible for pay plan are people who um, graduated sometime after 2014. Um, they took out their first loan at that point, I should say. They qualified. The rest of you are going to be on like IBR, revised pay as you earn, or income contingent repayment. Now with IDR forgiveness, it's tax free through 2025. And that's due to like a change related to the, CARE, to the CARES Act. I think it's called the American Heroes Act that eliminated um, taxes due on student loan cancellations or forgiveness. But it's temporary. Many of you won't qualify for forgiveness under an IDR plan until uh, the 2030s at the earliest. So if the law isn't extended, you may have to pay taxes on the amount forgiven. But here's the thing, there's a loophole. All right, so, oh damn, did I just repeat that slide twice? Look at that. All right, there we go, tax exclusions. Um, so the IRS has this thing um, where you can exclude a debt if you have an insolvency. So at the time the debt is canceled, you can avoid paying taxes on it if you're considered insolvent when it's uh, canceled. Now this uh, publication 4681 it covers all of this. There's uh, the exclusions, it walks you through it, insolvency, and there's an insolvency worksheet that you fill out. Insolvency is basically looking at your assets, then looking at your liabilities. If your liabilities are more than your assets, boom, you're done. Now, for many of you, you're like, well, I want to retire with assets or I'm going to have assets. And that's where the next part comes into play where you should really sit down with like an estate planning attorney um, to kind of figure out how do you shelter your assets. Now, many of you were gonna have to do this anyways if you own a home and have equity in it and you're getting ready for retirement and you wanna take advantage of Medic, uh, was it Medicaid, you can't have certain amount of assets anyway. So you need to start planning for asset preservation. Like, okay, how do I preserve these and how do I shelter them? So then you could avoid uh, having to pay taxes on things and also decrease your income on paper. That's not something I do. That is definitely something you talk to an estate planning attorney about, but there are ways to take advantage of these rules in order to avoid the tax hit on things. Um, and yeah, so let's go over that part, boom, all right. Disability discharge, real quick. If you have a severe, permanent mental or physical disability, you qualify. If it prevents you from working, you'll qualify for this. Now, some private lenders will write them off as well if you have documentation from the SSA or VA. I haven't seen them take letters from the doctor, but there is a way to get rid of your loans, at least as the borrower um, or the co-signer if you're disabled. Now, again, I want to stress, it doesn't matter what your disability is. It could be depression. It could be chronic fibromyalgia. It doesn't matter. I've seen people qualify with stage four cancer, right? Like you qualify based on your disability being severe and permanent. So it could be whatever. All right. Um, yeah, stress that there. Boom. 
You can qualify by having your doctor complete the discharge application. Another way to qualify is if the SSA or VA determine you're 100% disabled. The discharge application is really simple. It's a two-page form. You can just pull it up on the internet and basically just ask you to fill out your contact information and check off that you have a severe and permanent disability. Then you give it to your doctor and your doctor certifies it from there. Now it could be your primary care provision, your PCP, or it could also be a specialist. So it doesn't matter from that standpoint. Let me get some coffee in here. All right. Now, borrower defense. This is what a lot of you hit me up about, and I tell you on my intake form, I can't. I can help you with this, but I really don't like helping people with it because I don't know that I make that much of a difference in hiring me, and I hate for you to spend money on me, and I can't get the result that you're ultimately looking for. So you qualify for this if you believe your school lied to you about education quality, job placement, et cetera. You can apply for borrower defense to repayment program. It is hard to get rid of your loans with this program. Forgiveness has thus far has been limited to schools like Corinthian Colleges, ITT, ITT Tech. There are many of you that went to Sanford Brown Art Institute who still don't qualify. It may change in the future, but right now you don't qualify. Or at least you haven't been approved, I should say. That's the better way to put it. Um, I stress here, I don't typically help people with this. Some people still hire me to do it, and all I'm going to do is write your information in the best way possible succinctly and also to match it up with the laws that does apply to but i don't know if that's going to make that much of a difference application process you can apply for free at studentaid.gov slash borrower defense all right you may as far as the timeline some of you asked me how long does it wait under the trump administration it took years under the biden administration it's taking a few months up to six, seven months I've seen. Um, you can always check the status of it by calling the BDR hotline um, at the number there. So take a screenshot of that, whatever, boom, got it. All right, death. All federal student loans go away when you die. Parent plus loans go away when the parent borrower dies or the child you borrow the loan dies, all right? Private student loans, they uh, don't go away when the primary borrower dies. They still go after the co-signer at that point. All right, so, or vice versa, if the cosigner dies, it doesn't release you from the private student loan. All right, and then private student loans, federal loans go away at your death, they don't go after your wife, they don't go after your, your children, no one. But private student loans, they could file a claim on your estate, which is why some people get insurance to cover the private student loan payments, or they work, if they are knowing they're going to die, then they work with me or someone else to negotiate a settlement. All right, what is considered income for IDR plans? Many of you had the same question as well. Um, IDR plans and income. Any source of money you have to pay taxes on is considered income for the IDR plans, right? That includes W-2 wages, self-employment income, dividends from stocks, 401k disbursements, inheritances, whatever. That's considered income if you're paying taxes on it. It can also include Social Security if your other sources of income are high enough where you have to then pay taxes on Social Security. But normally, Social Security isn't taxed for most people. Now, you can certify your income using your tax return, pay stubs, benefit statement, et cetera. Now, that's the great thing, because some of you, you may have higher income on your taxes due to like you receive an inheritance, or your job was paying you more last year, you switched employers, whatever. Then you currently have your income was higher on taxes than it is now. That's totally fine. We don't have to use your taxes to certify your income. We can use your income on the day that we file. And that makes sense for some of you who have, inter like whose income is intermittent throughout the year. For some of you that are self-employed or you get rental income, your income, you're not really sure when it's gonna come in. At the end of the year, you may always net out to around 100,000. But at the time we're filling out the form, I'm gonna ask you, what is your income at that stage? And you'll say, well, I'm not earning anything right now, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get this in the future. Cool, pretty sure in the future don't mean shit because like there's no guarantee you're gonna get that money. Like right now I have like 30,000 in billables that people owe me. There's no guarantee I'm going to get that money. Yes, it sits on my book, but I, is, I haven't realized it as income at that point. So technically I may not have any income at that time if I don't have money coming in from another source. That's totally fine because the question is always, what is your income at the time you're filling out the form? You can use your tax return or you can use your current income if you've had a substantial decrease. All right, now 
Boom, I already said that. You can avoid using your spouse's income. This is a big thing. For some of you who um, are married, you're like, well, my spouse has nothing to do with my student loan debt. Cool. You can avoid using your spouse's income if you file taxes separately and are in the IBR, ICR, or pay plan. Now, what if you file taxes jointly? You can avoid your spouse's income if you don't have reasonable access to their income. Now, this trips many people up because they're like, well, we file taxes jointly. Don't I have reasonable access? And the pushback against that is twofold. One, tax return is a backwards looking thing. It looks at your income in the past. The form that you're filling out for IDR looks at your income as of that day. So it is possible that sure, you had reasonable access to their income at that point when you file taxes jointly. And, but if, what if their income is different today and they don't want to tell you about it? Do you have reasonable access at that point? The answer may be no. And if that's the case, you can avoid using their income. Secondarily to that, the IDR form requires your spouse to sign the form even if their income is not going to be used, even if they have no obligation on the loan, it's still going to be uh, used. So the question is, if their spouse refuses to sign the form, do you have reasonable access? And I've heard many student loan servicers tell people, no, just mark the box that you don't have reasonable access so we can just process it using your income that way. Now, is this like 100% like I can tell you legally you're well, well within your grounds? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you this is what I do for clients and I feel reasonably justified based off of the laws in front of me and how things have, proceed, have been presented by student loan services as well. as well. But it is kind of a gray area. All right, um, how can I pay what I originally borrowed? This is another thing. Many of you have had your student loans initially for 10 years, you couldn't pay on anything with them, couldn't afford it but the balance with interest and fees has grown over time, and now your income is doing better, or you have an inheritance, or you have a 401k you could borrow against, and you wanna to try to pay off the loans. Um, and pay, but you don't wanna pay what you owe now, you wanna pay your original balance. And the problem is you can't do that, like at least for federal loans, there's no way that's gonna happen. Now, federal student loans, there's no way to pay what you originally borrowed or less. After you default, Federal student loans typically settle for 90% of the current principal and 50% of the outstanding interest. Now there's, some, there's a little bit of a play there. I've been able to get lower amounts, but generally that's what I'm gonna tell people to look into. I can get rid of the fees, I may be able to get rid of, I should be able to get rid of 50% of the interest, and then I should be able to knock down the principal sum as well. All right? Now the settlement though, the catch with federal loans, you're usually not gonna get more than 90 days. Some of you may only get, <coughs> shit, this damn COVID. Some of you are only gonna get like 30 days to pay it in, right? But you don't get more than 90 days. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that for federal student loan settlements. The payment pause, some of you asked me this, has not changed the type of settlement offer people are getting for federal student loans. It is what it is. These rules, they, they are what they are, it don't matter. I don't care how old your loan is, I don't care that you haven't made a payment in forever, doesn't matter. I literally have clients that owe 200,000 that live in China, ain't never coming back, and they want to settle, and they're offering 100,000, and the government's like, no, we're not taking it. We want this settlement here. I can't do nothing for you on that one. All right, private student loans. It is common to negotiate a settlement for what you originally borrowed or less after you default on a private student loan. Settlement rates for private loans can change depending on the lender, age of the loan, payment history, credit scores, co-signers, all that good stuff. Settling a private student loan after you default it, it's not guaranteed though. There is some risk that you could default in it if you, don't, you aren't able to negotiate a settlement. I've only had that happen once in all my years and it's with a creditor, a lender I don't even handle settlements for, for people outside of bankruptcy anymore. Like if you're hiring me to negotiate a settlement with them, I'm not gonna take your money because like I had this experience and I have not been able to figure out why they won't take settlements. Um, but if you are able to negotiate a settlement, it's typically for somewhere between 35 to 70% of the outstanding balance. Settlement process. Step one, you gotta default. No if, if, ands, or buts about it. You can call your servicer up and be like, I wanna do a payoff right now. They'll say, cool, full balance due. They will not take a discount unless you default. Now defaulting means that for federal loans, you have to go nine months without a payment. 
For private suit loans, private suit loans are going to default slash be charged off around 180 days of non-payment. Step two, you make a settlement offer. You'll have to contact a collection agency your loans are with. Now this process is going to change um, with private suit loans more than federal loans. Federal loans, they default, they go from your servicer to a collection agency. Private student loans, some lenders, it goes from like um, the normal servicer to maybe an internal recovery unit slash like what they call post collections. Like with Navient, it goes from servicing to like pre-default to recovery slash post collections. And then it may go to an external collections, but usually I can call them up and say, hey, um, this client, they're about to default. Maybe we can work something out here. And then they can flag the account and then keep it in-house, typically. Now, you can make the offer over the phone or in writing. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that if the offer is accepted, get written confirmation of the settlement terms. It could be emailed to you. It could be a letter, whatever. Like, most companies send you a letter, but there are a handful of companies, they'll just email you and say, yep, accepted, here are the terms. Step three, you pay the settlement. After you pay the settlement, you'll get a clearance letter mailed out to you within a few weeks. Some lenders take a couple of months. And that clearance letter, it's not necessary. It's just a record for you to say, oh, here's my loan. <coughs> Shit. It's just a record for you to show that you made the payment. But again, you have the settlement contract and you have proof of your payment. The clearance letter is just like belts and suspenders. It's not necessary. Types of settlement offers. There's gonna be three types of offers. Lump sum, right? For federal loans, that's the one you're gonna get. It has to be paid in lump sum. Then it'll let you, if they give you 90 days to pay it off, you can break it up in monthly payments over those 90 days, but basically it's a lump sum at that point. You can do monthly payments. You could do this for private student loans. Now, um, they're usually not gonna give you more than like three years to pay it back. And I've seen five, but that's rare. And so, for instance, if you owe $100,000 and you want monthly payments on a settlement, let's say they want 50%, so that's 50,000. You have to ask yourself, can I afford to pay, a, what is it, like $1,000 a month over four years in order to get the settlement? They may be willing to accept that. But I usually see this with people with lower settlement amounts, uh, where it's just purely monthly payments. The general one I see more often than anything is lump sum plus monthly payments. This type of offer is going to be for private student loans, and generally you'll put down a few thousand dollars. Like whatever, I, like if you work with me, I'm gonna say, hey, what's the most you can put down comfortably in the next 30 days? Then how much can you afford on a monthly basis? And then I try to figure out, okay, what settlement can we get in that range? And we go from there. But again, thinking that they usually don't go more than three years every now and then four, every now and then five. Consequences of defaulting. Uh-oh, I've been talking a long time. My throat's starting to catch up with me. <coughs> uh, consequences. You'll get a credit score hit. You and your co-signer will take a hit to your credit scores for the missed payments. Federal loans, no co-signer usually. It's just you taking a credit hit. Um, your co if you default on private student loans, private student loans, you and your co-signer are gonna take a hit. Um, wage garnishment. The federal government can garnish your wages without a court order if you default. Private loans have to sue you first. So before they can put a lien on your home doing any of that stuff, they have to sue you first. All right? Lawsuit. The federal government typically doesn't sue because they can take your money involuntarily without a court order. But private lenders, they don't usually sue right after you default. I have never had a client sued while we're negotiating a settlement, but it could happen because you're in default. Generally speaking, private lenders, they wait until the statute of limitations is nearing um, to run out before they sue you. Some smaller credit unions, they may sue you right away, but usually big lenders, they don't because it's an added cost for them. They have to hire an attorney, they have to pay filing fees and all that stuff. So generally they avoid that, they try to get collections by other means first. All right, that is the end of the slideshow. I killed that, yay me. All right, so I have opened it up to you guys now. If you want to raise your hand, I'll knock out whatever questions you got, or you can drop it in chat if you don't feel like cutting on your mic. Okay, how does one check the number of premiums payments that would count under PSLF 
And can, how does one get credit for work at eligible organizations while loans were in default? So number one, can't get credit for payments made while you're in default, doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, does work at colleges, university count for PSLF program? Yeah, so if you work at a private institution, so long as it's a 501c3, you qualify. Most private educational institutions are 501c3s. There are a handful of for-profit um, charter schools out there, but the vast majority of 501c3 because they want the tax benefits. Um, museums, again, for PSLF, it don't matter what type of employer it is, it matters what's their status. Are they owned by the government? Are they a nonprofit? If they're a nonprofit, are they a 501c3? Yes, automatic, don't matter, they count. If they are not a 501c3, but they're a nonprofit, then do they provide a public service? And that's a determination that's gonna be made uh, by the Department of Education. As far as how do you track your payments? For many of you, there's not a great way to track your payments for PSLF or for income driven payment forgiveness. So, and what I mean is, if your loans are with your current servicer and you've been with them for a while, you can track your payments by requesting a payment history from your servicer. They'll send that to you. But what if your loans move from uh, another company to the one you're currently with? Or many of you are moving now, right? There's, it's really hard to get that record yourself. Um, you could put in a request to the Department of Education and try to get it, but that takes a long time, but you can, you can try that way. You could try contacting the old servicer, <coughs> assuming they're still open and you remember who they are, sure. Um, but generally for PSLF, it's worked out really well for people just by submitting employment certification and showing who they work for, and the Department of Education does a job on tracking down the payments from there. <coughs> All right, uh, sorry about that. Can you explain verification that has occurred during the year for ICR for the future year? Um, so this person is confused whether or not you have to use your tax return or your income for the previous year. Let's do this instead. Because um, I, I get how it's confusing. Because anytime there's options, people get confused. So anytime you're applying for income driven repayment, you have the option to use either um, your tax return or alternative documentation of income. <coughs> so, I'm so sorry, y'all. I apologize. Um, all right, let me pull this up. Share. All right, so this is the income driven repayment form. This box is all about your borrower information, right? This is about choosing plans. This is about your marital status. Let's get down to the income part. All right. Has your income significantly decreased since you filed your last federal income tax return? For example, have you lost a job, experienced a drop in income, gotten divorced? What, but did you most recently file a joint return with your spouse but has since become separated or lost the ability to access your spouse's inf income information? If the answer to that is yes, then the question is, do you currently have taxable income? Check no if you don't have any income or received only untaxed income. If you receive taxable income, cool. It says drop down the uh, following instructions in section five. Let's see what section five says. Section fives. You only need to follow this instruction if based on your answers in section four, you and your spouse were instructed to provide documentation of your current income instead of a tax return. You must provide documentation of all taxable income of you and your spouse. Taxable income includes income from employment, unemployment income, dividend income, interest income, tips and alimony. But you don't have to provide child support, social security income, or public assistance. And this documentation can be a pay stub or letter from your employer listing your gross pay. For example, for self-employed people, we put together a letter that lists out their gross pay for that month, and you write on there how often you get paid, twice per month, every other week. And you have to provide one source per source of taxable income. So for some of you, if you're using your tax return, it's a super answer. You just answer no and use your tax return. But if you had a change in income, then you have to provide sources of your taxable income. It, that's what we do is kind of go through those things, that analysis. All right, um, hopefully that, that takes care of that one. 
Um, next one up. I made eight years of payment while employed by the federal government before I left the job. If I continue to make payments, will they still be considered under PL, uh, public service? No. Short answer, no. Here's the thing. The PSLF waiver, it gives you credit for payments made while working full time for the government or nonprofit anytime after October 1st, 2007 through present. So if you worked and you worked eight years and then you left employment, well then you only get eight years of credit towards forgiveness. You still got two years to go. And if you return to the nonprofit or the government, then you pick up where you left off with that credit. But you you have to do that. There's no way you're gonna get forgiven. Now, let's say you are someone who has retired and you used to work full time for the government or a nonprofit and you made 120 payments after October 1st, 2007 while working full time for the government or nonprofit and then you retired. Can you take advantage of the waiver? Yes. You can take advantage of the waiver because you have those 120 payments. You believe that you're going to get your loans forgiven. But if they count those up and they say, oh, you only have 118 payments, you got two more to go, well, you got to come out of retirement, go back to work for the government or nonprofit, get those two months, then get your loans forgiven, and then you're done. That's, it, it's really that, that straightforward. All right, any other questions coming through the chat or turning on the mic? All right, I'm gonna give it a minute or two. Uh, why would credit reports each have different amounts for loan debt than the government site? Um, many of you, you're gonna get confused by your credit report versus like your student loan account. <coughs> so two things are, Two things could be happening. <coughs> Shit. Sorry. Um, one, when you look at your account online with the Department of Education or your servicer, you're looking at your loan balance as of that day. Your credit report is a historic looking document. It's looking backwards, what was reported at the beginning of the month. So there's gonna be some variance there. <coughs> Also, student loans fall off the credit report if you have been in default for more than seven and a half years. So, oh shit. Let me get some water. If they fall off, then they won't want, they'll no longer be on your credit report, and, but you'll still have a balance owed on there. If there are drastic differences between the amounts, then you may have an accuracy issue and then you can challenge that through um, the credit bureau on the accuracy of the amounts listed. So th that's what I'll do there. If there's persists to be a problem, you don't have a student loan problem, you have a credit reporting problem, so you can work with a, what's called a Fair Credit Reporting Act attorney to try to get that resolved. <coughs> Sorry, man, this is, I'm, I may have to call it here. This is falling apart for me. Um, do I need to consolidate my four Fed loans in one loan with AES to continue with IDR? It's hard to say whether you should consolidate or not without looking at your loans. If your loans are with AES, then you have what are called FFEL loans if they're federal. FFEL loans qualify for income-based repayment even if you don't consolidate them so long as they're not parent plus loans. If they're loans you borrow for yourself and they're FFEL, they qualify for IBR and you may not need to consolidate. If you do consolidate, then you qualify for revised pay as you earn, which is a cheaper payment than IBR. And so it may make sense for you to consolidate, but there's no way I can tell you without looking at your loans what's best for you. Um, I know that you're not a fortune teller, but what are the implications that Biden uh, does for give 10,000? Um, actually, I just wrote an uh, article on this one. Um, my impression is that it's likely not going to happen, but if it does, it will, we will see it during um, the midterm election cycle. Um, so yeah, here's the article, 10,000 is too long, forgive us what you need to know. It just came out January 6th, and I just walked through it like the likelihood, kind of like I analyzed all the statements from Kamala Harris, from his advocates and everything, so you can check that out online um, as well, and I'll include it in the email. 
but basically, they're, you have Chuck Schumer, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, Presley, they're all pressing for some type of forgiveness. <coughs> but it's, there's pushback against it because federal bars only represent like 43 million of the population. There are a bunch of non, there are a bunch of other Americans, especially older Americans, um, who are against awarding for uh, loan forgiveness. And you don't want to piss those people off because they're voters. So it may not happen. And plus, the argument too is, how does forgiving student loans actually solve the actual problem, which is rising tuition costs? And so what we, you're just kicking the can down the road and doing it all over again. What, may, what we may see is elimination of interest or, or reducing the interest down from that standpoint, but I doubt that we're gonna see forgiveness. And if we do see any forgiveness, it's gonna be nominal. And now it'd be nominal if you owe 100,000, but for those of you who owe 10,000, it's great. And so it, it really just depends, but I, I don't think we're gonna see it, but if we do, I think it's gonna be small and it's gonna be limited. All right, try it hot, Tony. I appreciate it. All right, <coughs> well, I think I'm gonna cut it off here because like this is getting ridiculous. I appreciate you all. I'll have the re replay out to you um, when it's ready. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.